with each other because after this, um, they'll be talking about their works with Arlene. So I'm gonna just bring us to the entrance of the gallery. And this is Edra's piece, and she will be going into much more depth into the work with Arlene. But we um, thought this a great introduction as to what you were going to see as you walked in um, the gallery, sort of a pre-prep of um, what the exhibition talks about. In addition, um, during this pandemic and during New York City being closed, we've had public um, artwork or artwork people could interact with in our windows um, since the beginning of, before the year started, but it's been a few exhibitions that people, if the gallery is closed, will always have interaction with an artwork in the window. Um, so here is, um, when you enter, you'll actually um, be seeing a few different pieces that really occupy space. And that was really um, important for us. So there's two artists that really take the center of the gallery, and that would be Victoria and Ivelisse, who both will be talking about these um, pieces that they use. But here we see Ivelisse at the center. Um, for us, we saw this like cascading movement through abstraction, and we wanted to complement that with um, Marisol's pieces that are um, the black pieces on either side. That manipulation of the eye, the idea of shapes and patterns sort of moving through space. Um, in the same similar way that Eva Lisa's pieces are literally moving through space. Um, this is actually, um, when you first walked in, this is Victoria's piece that again, occupies the entire entrance with a little archway to pass through and experience the rest of the gallery. And you'll see here that on either side is um, CJ's work, who is an artist who works with, um, in this particular series with tile. Um, and so we thought in terms of this idea of geometric abstraction and playing with what that actually means and all the symbolism and meanings that go behind it. Um, here is another space. So from right to left, from right is Beverly, center is with the pink is CJ, then it's um, Victoria, and then lastly, the hot pink piece is Edra. Um, and I think this, you guys, I think just visually you can understand that here we're playing with the idea of space again, um, the idea of um, how each artist is using this geometric shape, this square, it's something that's very common and we see all the time, and how each artist is using that and approaching it in different ways through their own means. So on the right you have Beverly, who she'll talk more about her idea of light, um, CJ, who really occupies um, the body when she uses her work. Um, Victoria here is referencing steps and stairs found in um, pre-colonial history. And then Edra's piece that mimics gates and doors. So again, um, a shape that is very common and how each artist is approaching it with something that we wanted to talk about. And then finally, we have Arlene. Um, I think everyone knows Arlene. If we were all live, we'd be clapping. So I think we should all just clap. <laughs> um, we, Natalie and I were blessed to meet Arlene a few years ago at Mecca Art Fair in Puerto Rico. Um, we just had this wonderful conversation about art, where it was going, where um, Latinx artists were moving, how were they gonna fit in terms of contemporary art market. And we just all hit it off on how there were so many important artists that were being missed from this genre of um, artists that we felt that should be seen. And if you don't, you should have her book. It's a great book. I have all my notes here. There, I have a billion notes. Um, but the best page for me is page 166, where we are. <laughs> so Arlene, I'm gonna allow you to go ahead and take over because I don't like talking, so. Absolutely, thank you. Um, thank you, Amanda. And uh, as an academic, I'm used to just preparing prepared statements because otherwise I'll just blabber and take too much space from what's really the center of this conversation, which is listening to the artist. So I have actually timed myself for less than three minutes. Bear with me. Okay. So I want to thank Amanda and Natalie for organizing the show and for the continued commitment to Latinx artists and also thank the artists for producing such powerful work. My role today is to moderate the conversation and basically ensure viewers appreciate the incredible talent of the exhibited artists. 
when Amanda reached out to me about this conversation, I was immediately excited because it is such a timely and welcome time to think about abstraction. A number of shows and exhibitions, most notably Latinx Abstract and Greek, has brought, brought attention to abstraction. Finally, as a popular and vibrant resource among Latinx artists, um, challenging stereotypes about what is Latinx art and how it should look like. As we know, these stereotypes have historically politicized abstraction as not belonging to artists of color, which is exactly why we need more shows like this to visualize a world where Latinx artists have the right to produce free of imposed expectations, constraints, and assumptions. The artists in the exhibition have created impressive works that help us do this. And tonight, you'll hear how the exhibited artists challenge the minimalist ideas that we tend to associate with abstraction, such as weaving artisanal materials and processes as those Victoria Martinez with textiles, or by drawing from marginalized histories and narratives spanning the African roots of urban design and the aesthetics of fences in Puerto Rico as those Erra Soto. We will hear how Celia Jurado draws on the composition and the destruction of materials to evoke intimate experiences of migration, and how Marisol Martinez creates visual vocabularies through color and shapes to convey affective states. Finally, we will also appreciate how abstract artists force us to engage with deep theoretical and conceptual questions around self, society, and space as does Beverly Asha in paintings proposing new ways of seeing, and it Elise Jimenez's intricate installation paintings linking consciousness and experience. In fact, all of their work is very generative, and you will see a lot of interlocking interests and themes across their work too, as those that Amanda has already started to lay out in the introduction. I trust tonight's conversation will help us recognize abstraction as a powerful resource for self-invention and, and, and self-making, and for crafting openings and experiences and new ways of thinking. I assure you, you're up for a treat because I had the opportunity to talk very briefly with each of these incredible women's artists, and they're all brilliant and amazing, and they deserve all the limelight and for the work to be included in all types of exhibitions and conversations about migration, landscapes, architecture, freedom, visuality, and more. But I will let them tell you about their work. So we're going to start with Beverly. Ish is going to talk for about three to five minutes about one of the pieces in the exhibition, after which we're going to have a curated conversation between us, and we will open it up for audience Q&As around 7.50. So hold on to those questions, and I'll let you know when you can begin to send them our way. Thank you. Beverly. Thank you, Arlene. Hi, everybody. Um, so, <laughs> um, so this is one of the paintings included in the exhibition. Um, it's actually a, a, right at the entrance. And this painting and the other ones that are in the exhibition were all made um, at the same time in the same place. And so one of the things I wanted to mention about my work is that it's, you know, they're really made as a group of paintings at a time, sort of simultaneously. And so the three that are in the show sort of have this sort of relationship of color, relationship of form, um, and then also relationship of playing, of playing with space um, and sort of architectural forms, or I guess what maybe is perceived first as geometry, right? Which is one of the things that was mentioned. Um, so this painting, um, a lot of times I like set up sort of uh, questions for myself, like, can I do this? Or can I make, um, for instance, with this one, like, can the color itself make the space in the painting feel different or make it feel like multiple spaces in one. So one of the things um, that all the paintings had in common was that I was really interested in seeing if I could capture the way um, light and space and specifically the sort of dusk, um, the colors of dusk in New Hampshire, which is uh, where I was. These are all made in the summer in New Hampshire at McDowell, which is an artist residency. And um, so I became really interested in trying to find the sort of really specific kind of pink that sits against a really specific kind of green of the trees that turns into black and sort of sort of the sort of the way that time really changes color was something that is that has been very in, sort of interesting to me, but that was really important to to these paintings and to this painting in particular. Um, and so I usually actually start my work um, without a plan at all. I, I really, as, when I get to a new space or when I start a new group of paintings, it, I usually create a bunch of drawings, um, sometimes prints. Um, 
And then really everything comes out of the color. So I'll start mixing colors and, and something will just feel meaningful and right. And usually it comes out of something observed. So something that I've noticed around me, um, something that I've been looking at a lot, trying to understand. Um, and so I spend a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, what is it about the color and is it symbolic or meaningful or um, how does it relate to a kind of internal experience? Um, so I guess color and landscape specifically, which is constantly shifting and changing, um, like all the time, it's so momentary, um, becomes a kind of site of, I guess, gen it's very generative. Um, so for this painting, one of the things in the title sort of speaks to it, um, the title, which is Espacio Vertical Tres Veces Tres Horas, so vertical space, three times, three hours. Um, I started using titles more recently as a way to sort of um, just kind of give a language, like an actual way to enter the work um, in a really literal way. And that started initially by titling them from like the place that they were made in um, and subtitling them that. Um, and slowly it's sort of become a, a way to also think about um, sound, which I think of as a very sort of interesting relationship to time, right? Because it's happening across time and it has this sort of rhythm to it and it has a texture to it and, it and it speaks to the space that it's happening in, right? So like a big space will have a different sound quality than a small space. And because I'm really interested in the way that space is quite psychological, um, that makes a lot of sense to me. So when I think of repetition, I also think of sound. And when I think of language, I think there's also this link there to, to sound, right? Like when you don't understand meaning, you still have this auditory experience. And so I sort of decided to title, um, in Spanish, in part because of that relationship to, I was like, even though I have a possibly mostly English speaking audience in a lot of cases in the, in the places where art is shown or where my art is shown as like traditional painting, oil painting, um, I like the idea of it also ha having a song, like trying to, what it, what it sounds like to say the title. So um, I guess I've said like a bunch of different things just now, but I think all of that is sort of linked and I hope that, um, and, and the last thing I guess I'll say is that the shapes in my work and the color in my work, I think across the grouping of paintings, they sort of become a sort of lot, there's like a logic in it that I hope in seeing a group of my work, it sort of gives you an entrance into understanding sort of a kind of architecture or kind of space or a kind of even like emotional quality. Um, I think that's my five minutes. <laughs> um, thank you. Great. Thank you so much, CJ. Um, I know Cecilia is not feeling well, and I think it's very brave and generous that she's with us today. I know she's going to be very brief, so I urge you to um, read a lot about um, Cecilia. She posts a lot in Instagram. You could know, um, you could, you, um, you can learn a lot more uh, about her that you will be able to to hear from her tonight. So, uh, Cecilia. Yeah. Uh, hi. How are you? Um, yeah. I'm. I'm sorry. I am. Um, I'm a little sick. These days, everybody is sick. So um, yeah, I got. I got the sickness of the of the of the season. Let's say, and I hope I just get through this and I continue my life. Um, so this this uh, this uh, specific piece and the walls that I present uh, on this show at Lashki, uh, um, I call them bodies um, and they are these pieces that I make from scratch uh, with the tiles and uh, over wood and then I break them uh, and for me are um, relate directly with people that are in transit um, as I, I, I have been in transit uh, many times in my life I'm still in transit right now between uh, Lima Peru where I am right now and New York and this piece is called uh, waterfall after crying and it's a piece actually that originated uh, it was um, pink and salmon as the other piece in the show. Um, and it was somehow very beautiful, but I thought it was too, too clean, too, too unreal. Um, uh, and I thought it needed, it needed to have more history. So I started to, to break it more. And at some point it went too far and it was too broken. 
and I wanted to return to to give it a little bit more of a wholeness. Um, so then I, I realized that opening it, I wanted also to like kind of run uh, water on it. And in this idea of the running water, um, I started to put layers of layers of layers of um, moving acrylic water, um, acrylic, uh, white acrylic, and literally gave a lot of baths of um, white. And somehow I, I, I thought I brought it back to life after um, many layers of, of this and it, 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 it relates also with my, my use of um, water and the, the idea of the water that it's something that it goes through everything. It, it can get into like a little hole and keep running, you know, like a river keeps going and you can't stop it. So this piece is, is this wall, this little wall, but at the same time it has this, um, the sensation of of being dripping still, no, and I I like that because it it, it becomes more alive, as is the water that doesn't stop. That's I guess that I don't know if that will be enough, but thank you. Um, I also I, love I, I, spoke. <laughs> I also love the title of yes. Um, we're gonna. Um, we'll talk more later. Um, Ivelisse, I don't know if you're here in the grid. Hi, Ivelisse. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Everybody. Yeah. Good night. Um, well, I think that. Um, 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 I think every time I, I speak about my work, I feel like I need to speak about abstraction in general and the way I, I see abstraction and, and what abstraction does for me. Uh, abstraction always brings a question about uh, of what it may signify, you know, what, what does it mean? So, so to me, abstraction is a way to explore, uh, first of all, the relationship between consciousness and experience, like, like Arlene said before. And it's, it's one of it's kind of the, the center of my concern. And, and but we can, I mean, expand expanding on that. We can say that, um, you know, I see in abstraction a way uh, a language that create, creates openings and, and that presents possibilities. And and also because it is, it's important to me because it, it keeps alive uh, a thought that is not instrumental, non instrumental thought. Um, so. On the other hand, abstraction has also served as a space to, to challenge, uh, for me, to, to challenge fixed narratives and, and funda fundamentalisms and, and to challenge uh, the assumptions of, of representation. For example, when viewers question what they are looking at, it is also a way to question the way we construct meaning. So, I come from a political, pol uh, politically polarized colonial island, um, uh, and here every every issue is reduced to to a political partition debate uh, over statehood, independence, etc. And and I think that that has been something that has created in me a need to contest uh, taken for granted means and and kind of narrowing perspectives and and. Um, and it takes me to, to, to the openings I see in abstraction. So in simple terms, I think uh, abstraction is a way to work through the complexities around me and, and mainly also the complexities of language itself uh, and verbal language and my relationship to words and to verbal language itself, you know, and, and how, how words cannot be confined uh, or uh, a better said, uh, meaning cannot be confined to the word. Um, so, 
the uh, working with 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 the images of abstraction that abstraction bring and and relating to to the presence of the piece and and, and all the, the the constructions and oppositions uh, and contradictions that the piece itself brings uh, it's a way to expand definition for me and um, for example the the definition of what is politics of of politics and what is political you know and 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 it's a way of moving beyond uh, superficial meanings and representation and to and to see into experience itself and uh, what what experience itself uh, is telling us again i think i want to challenge uh, the idea of, of whole representations and and that's why i work with installation and installations and and collage and and why i use this mix mash and where you know i juxtapose things where nothing is really integrated in a permanent way or definitive or to the finish and um i think that's the way i best communicate a sense of of fluidity and impermanence great that's awesome. thank you so much i think we go for um uh, marisol i think it's the next one Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, just want to say thank you to Arlene first for moderating this uh, beautiful talk. It's such an honor to be on this talk with everybody. Um, and thank you, of course, to Natalie and Amanda for making this amazing exhibit come to life. I'm very honored to be part of it. Um, the Space Between Us is a series that I did specifically for this exhibition. Um, a lot of my work in the past are patterns and graphics and geo geometrics based off of meditations that I've had with myself in the studio and uh, stillness and allowing the quietness of uh, what is happening within me to come out into canvas. And this specific series, The Space Between Us, was really taking apart all of the other um, works that I've done in terms of the, uh, the shapes and the colors and the circles and graphics and um, more so in the to, to kind of express the context of what's going on with us as a society right now through the pandemic, through uh, Black Lives Matter, through the political you know, turmoil that we saw ourselves in. A lot of that all happened at once and it was a very intense uh, to say the least, intense time frame, which we're, I feel like we're finally getting out of. But to me, this is a representation of us as a society, us as people. Are we going to be able to come back together? Are we going to fit with each other? How are we going to fit with each other? The space between us was kind of my ode to, you know, the time frame, the society that we're living in right now, and hopes that, you know, we will be able to find our way back to this society or actually reconstruct the society not to go back to go to a new society because obviously what we were living in wasn't working before so for me this is opening up a conversation about how will how will we fit this time and will we fit together will some of us still be apart will some of us you know um so kind of like just maybe be in our own little corners how will we interact with each other as humans through all of this incredible turmoil incredible darkness that we went through so um this is just kind of my visual uh representation of where i see us right now as humans and that's what a lot of my work has to do with and i use geometrics and abstraction you know as beverly said and Elise, um to kind of break up that com that that thought process of what um Latinas can be or what abstraction is or, you know, artists that kind of allow you to open up and see things in a different light, not so much what you keep seeing all the time, but opening up something different for you to have a different experience, a different perspective, and hopefully, uh, you know, that'll break you open to become a better person to create a better society. So that's what my work is really. Thank you, Victoria. This is wonderful. Thank you, Saul. 
sorry. Uh, okay, so my piece is a it's a double sided painting. Um, you know, I have a I have a huge desire always to to have some sort of interaction with the audience. Um, and so this is a beginning um, of a larger scale project where I will attempt to create um, architectural um, spaces with fabric. Um, and I usually work with collage because I feel like my mind tends to kind of bounce all over the place. And I like to borrow from, um, from, from landscapes or from traveling. Um, and also like I'm highly inspired by like pyramids and like pre-Hispanic ruins. And um, every time that I visit Latin America, specifically um, the ancient architecture in Mexico, I love to view and look at um, murals that exist within nooks and different corners of pyramids. And also just to kind of think, um, I think a lot about um, people who, indigenous people who once upon a time built um, all these different spaces by hand. Um, I also am influenced by like the urban environment um, and graffiti and street art. Um, and so I started writing in, with text, um, mainly in Spanish. And okay, so the writing that is on the painting, there's one typo, but um, I also tend to work in different like, different like spurts of time. Like sometimes I'll, I'll wake up at like 4 a.m. and I'll paint something or sometimes I'll kind of wait until noon to paint. But I, what I wanted it to, to um, kind of explain or to kind of express was like, I wanna sing a dream to you. I have a dream book that I have and I write my dreams down every time I remember them. So I have all, all these different stories and all these different interpretations and desires within this book that I don't really get to share. Um, and I am not a singer, but I, I always like want to be able to sing something. So that's why I, in my notes that I have, I, I wrote down like, I quiero cantarte un, una canción. But <laughs> one, one morning, like at 4 a.m., I ended up just um, writing this. And I try to, try to say, I want, I want to, I guess I want to like tell you the dream, but I misspelled it. But in a way, I think it's fine because, um, you know, the more that I learn about like um, colonialism and even like the Spanish language, like um, it, it's an, like to me, like Spanish is an interesting language because, well, it came, you know, it's part, it's, it's a colonial language and it was forced upon so many different people across Latin America. And I, you know, I've noticed as growing up in, in, in America that um, if, just through memory and experience, like if people speak Spanish, it's kind of like frowned upon or kind of like belittled. Um, but it's interesting because it's it's it comes from like European or origin. So, um, so yeah, it's it's pretty much like a collage of thought and imagination. And um, you know, I look forward to to cre to creating more and more um, fiber pieces that are architectural and hopefully. Um, um, begin to introduce this more in a three-dimensional form with fabric. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Edra. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we're good. You can hear me. Hi. Uh, well, first, thank you so much to, to Natalie and Amanda for inviting me to be a part of the exhibition. And thank you, Arlene, for, you know, for, for doing this. It's an honor to be in conversation with you and with the artists. Um, the work that I am presenting for this exhibition, I have two, two bodies of work, but uh, this one that you were looking at is titled Graft, and Graft is uh, an ongoing uh, project that uh, consists on uh, architectural interventions, uh, and they are representative of uh, 
immersive installations that sometimes are, are accompanied by uh, by publications or uh, by uh, literary contributions. Um, uh, I think uh, my work uh, is about uh, relationships. It's about uh, personal relationships and geographical relationships, and and many times uh, they are inspired by the communities that I I, I get to be in contact with and so uh it's inevitable that i ended up uh, making work um that speaks about the place where i grew up uh, uh and so um what what you're looking at in the facade of the gallery is a representation of a of a reja and a reja will be a uh, raw iron screen, and they're uh, very uh, um, they prevail in, in in the visual culture of Puerto Rico. Uh, they exist mostly in the uh, uh, lower and middle class homes. Um, they were built around the the fifties and the sixties, and I grew up in an in a neighborhood in a in a a gated community uh, that was built around the 50s. And many of the houses have uh, these uh, particular decorative patterns, uh, either uh, with a uh, quebrasol or <laughs> there, <laughs> quebrasoles, which are the uh, uh, decorative concrete blocks or or the rejas, which are the uh, raw iron fences. And um, uh, I was seeking or trying to, to find a connection on, on how, how to, I was looking to, or trying to figure how to represent my condition as somebody that uh, migrates. Uh, uh, I constantly travel uh, from Puerto Rico to Chicago, and I live in Chicago, but I constantly travel to Puerto Rico, so I have strong ties to to Puerto Rico, and uh, it it was impossible to avoid thinking about uh, about this constant coming and going, um, and how to how to you know uh, sort of uh, reconcile with that relationship. So uh, I start thinking about migration, and um, uh, I think it, it, it was through uh, an invitation to do a, a, a site responsive project that I, I came up with this idea of graft. And I titled the word graft because uh, among the many meanings of graft, graft uh, is uh, a type of skin transplant, and I start thinking about the uh, the rejas as as my you know almost like a type of self portrait where I uh, where I try to complement the space as seem uh, uh, seamlessly as possible. Or uh, I also think about settling, you know, like how I physically position myself. Or settle myself into a, a space, um, and uh, I think it is it's really hard when when I you know uh, live most more than half of my life in Puerto Rico, and then move uh, to the United States. My reference to the United States um, it was uh, through um, you know uh, the media, through the radio and television. And that's kind of how I I receive information uh, uh, during my upbringing, and I I was kind of fascinated by by American culture. I I, I always talk about American culture as a, my 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 personal exotic. I I was fascinated by the music and the sounds, and but but I very I'm very aware that uh, the information that I that I received was mostly mainstream. Uh, information comes from the mainstream. 
Um, and well, I guess something that I should mention that uh, this project have given me the opportunity to do is explore ideas of visibility and invisibility because uh, the you know the decor these decorative patterns have this kind of ubiquitous quality that um, allow for for being integrated in the in the domestic space if they're pleasant they're recognizable and things that have kept me interested in continuing the project uh, are um, my my curiosity on on uh, learning more about the origins of the patterns um, um, i I think about it uh, a lot in in relationship to visual art because a lot of artists also uh, refer to these patterns and utilize the patterns and they integrate it into their artwork and i I start thinking about uh, you know like how uh, like contrary to uh, colonial architecture uh, this type of vernacular architecture um, have haven't been included or, or exploring in in primary and secondary education and and what what will be the reason for that so um, through the literary component uh, I, I, I explore the possibility of of you know um building an archive that can eventually be integrated in into primary and secondary education i think this is it for now thank, <laughs> thank you. you so why don't we get all the artists back and uh let's have a, a conversation um, and I encourage everyone on the meantime to uh, send us questions in the chat while we converse. And um, so feel free to just send them, add them in the chat. So um, I guess I want to um, have the artists turn their videos on so we can see each other. Okay, here we're back. Yes. Um, so I, I, I must say that, you know, these are really very, um, these are amazing artists. They have a lot to say and each of their practice actually could take a whole hour. I had the ability to just talk very briefly for with each and I could say that I could, I could spend hours with each of them. Their practice is, is, is very thoughtful, is very rigorous, is very theoretical. They all have so much to say. So it's kind of sad that we get to only, you know, you only get to say three minutes from them. I really encourage you to learn more about their practice. Um, because we don't have much time, I wanted to perhaps um, get you talking a little bit about your practice in relationship to, um, I, I, I feel like there's, you know, there's almost a cliche to think about abstraction as a decolonial practice in a way, um, especially when it is women, um, women of color, right? Um, something that is, it, it's a statement that basically embraces the opacity or refuses representation, as Ivelli said, um, or perhaps that weaves uh, marginal histories like Ethra talks about in terms of um, uh, vernacular architecture. And I wanted to, or perhaps by creating languages um, that basically confront the reader with, with, the, with the task, right? of just trying to figure it out. It's kind of like, you know, there's something really important here in our work. We're not going to tell you what it is. You're going to have to do some work. So, so I wanted I us want to, and I, do you hear an echo or is it just me? Just me. There's an echo, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I apologize. But, um, so let me, there's nothing I can do um, except um, ask um, Beverly to start with this conversation why me <laughs> um well i mean i was thinking about <laughs> i can definitely start us off but um i was thinking about oh the echo is very intense um i guess like for me there's this way in which i think like even just thinking about like what i already said about sort of observation or thinking about landscape 
um, that even though I'm drawing from things that I see, I'm really interested in the way that abstraction, like I think the word opacity is pretty interesting, but also kind of a, a recontextualization is possible when you don't have familiarity, familiarity with what you're looking at and when there might be something that is familiar in the case of my work, uh, potentially. Um, and that there is a kind of restructuring or the possibility, I think there, that abstraction opens up this kind of space of potential for like other types of interpretations or other kinds of structures, um, at least in the way that I think about it and the way that I experience sort of abstraction as a language. Um, like even thinking about a pattern and like what is, what is a pattern and the history of patterns and how we sort of come to like recognize, like even just like what is recognition of something um, that is a shape or that is a re repeated shape. I mean, I mean, that's like super, I guess I like starting there because I think there's something interesting about pattern. Like we don't need to like know it in a, any kind of like uh, representational kind of way, if that makes sense. I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in, but. Yeah, I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking Marisol or Ivelisse. Uh, especially thinking about patterns and, and well, shapes. and architecture and structure, right? Absolutely. Like, um... Yes. Well, uh, more. Yeah, I I follow follow it up with what you're saying. Um, I think um, uh, also uh, apart from pattern, and um, it's it's also a thought about what do you what you want the work to do and how are you are thinking about about the possibilities of abstraction for example if you're thinking uh, in terms of what you're looking at and kind of uh, creating constructing a narrative or, or representing an experience um, you know are you are are you using abstraction to represent um, or or to construct a narrative or are you using an abstraction to present an experience itself, you know, uh, uh, in itself, you know, um, and I think I, in my, in my, um, in my work, what I, 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 I'm trying more to investigate an experience of that has to do with meaning and how we construct, uh, you know, the hierarchy of what is more important. Uh, to us and how, you know, in terms of what the eye pays attention to first and what it looks at after, et cetera, you know, and, um, and I think that that to me has to do with, uh, with challenging, um, you know, uh, like I said before, whole representations and, um, and uh, you know, uh, fixed narratives and, 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 creating awareness, you know, about uh, how we construct uh, meaning around something that is not telling you directly what it is. Um, so I think that's my contribution. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fantastic. Ezra, do you want to add, I also want to uh, pick your brain also as uh, someone who teaches, right, and who, who also is engaged with, you know, the beta on abstraction, and, and, and I wonder if you could uh, add a little bit to that conversation um, about, you know, abstraction as a language for, you know, young generations and Latinx artists in particular. We've had this conversation about um, you know, the stereotypes of who can or cannot do abstraction, which is something that I think is important to really, really understand. Like when I talked to Elise, I know that 20 years ago when she was in New York City a lot, you know, she, there, her, her, the people that she was engaging with were primarily white males doing abstraction, you know, because there's this, this idea that, you know, where are the communities of artists? It's this, this idea that and when I spoke with each of you, you, you spoke about this issue in particular, about the, 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 the kind of uh, struggle to assert, right? Um, in an idiom and, and, and um, um, without these kinds of ideas of, of what Latinx art is or what it should look like. So, Edra. Yeah, well, uh, I, I personally, in my, in my practice, I deviate between you know, uh, representations of, of different kinds and, and, and the abstraction that, uh, that this, uh, this particular body of works uh, embrace uh, and is, 
it's mostly because I, I uh, would talk about potential, but that that's exactly what brought me to, uh, to settle with this, this project and, and continue to explore it. What is, what is the, right. the potential uh, of, of the, the meaning of this? Uh, what, what the content, what, it, what could it potentially uh, contribute to, to the culture? Um, how are we looking at our current, you know, our current situation? What I, I, I think about uh, a popular culture uh, when I when I think about this project because uh, I feel like it's always um, like the the overlooked aspects of uh, vernacular language that um, m make me think about what is it that it is being uh, focused on and it is it's kind of incredible to me like uh, my experience my experience as a Puerto Rican, <laughs> it feels almost like a, a very, very small uh, because uh, my experience will be in in the uh, in in the household. I spend a lot of time in the house at, at home, uh, so the domestic environment is become very important to me. That but a lot of information that I acquire from the domestic environment uh, comes from from media. You know, so I. Uh, when I, and, and, and like my, uh, my traveling, you know, so I, uh, when I look at, when I travel to Puerto Rico, for example, I see Puerto Rico as a, as a tourist, and then I see Puerto Rico as somebody that, that lives there. And I think about uh, Puerto Rico, how it's represented in the media. So I, I my, my, um, to me, fascinating that still after over 500 years uh you know of yeah. um, uh, being a, a colony uh, there's elements of of colonial architecture that represent Puerto Rico and uh, one one that is it almost looked insignificant will be the you know the the watchtower, which is in Spanish, the garita. So la garita is something that I've been I've been collecting uh, documentation. I've been documenting whatever I see it. I will take pictures of it because it's everywhere, and it's it's more than everywhere. It's like it's it it used it's used like an emblem uh, for. It's actually the logo for the tourism company. <laughs> And I, I kept thinking, this is, is absurd. It's absurd. It's almost like we have settled, we have accepted the condition of, <laughs> of, of, of being, being a colony. I, I see on, on television local, local, um, local programs, uh, local shows where they will have the garita in the backdrop uh, yeah. or, or it will be like the, the logo for like Univision or other television shows like for the news it will be the this particular element which is is a military element and it's uh it's just uh also like a a, a very uh disappointing uh architectural element when you when you visit it <laughs> which you will only find that in old san juan maybe there's other places right but if you go to san juan and you visit the garita you will think wow it's it smells terrible it's like yeah it's, yeah, yeah. It, even is <laughs> laughing even is i hope you contribute to this conversation i have like right now i have like 40 pictures of like where i find this garita everywhere inserted uh, and it's driving me nuts i'm like i need to make this kind of more obvious because my project is not really trying to be in anybody's face, you know, like you have to approach it, you have to get close, you know, only your interest will kind of uh, allow for, for you to see what, what is, you know, 
underneath you know i i, I wanted um i wanted um everyone to actually feel free to look at the chat and basically see if there's a question that you know you want to answer but before that i wanted um all the artists to perhaps reflect a little bit about the importance of this exhibition i was very excited when amanda told me about this exhibition because of the fact that it's it's women you know female identified lab you know latinx artist and how powerful is that especially when we think about abstraction as this kind of like white male dominant um, genre to actually have a space where we could have not only you know uh, female artists but so, from such diverse backgrounds right um, and generations working in different themes so when you think about abstraction you know it's like from from the different materials you know to more geometric to but to shapes to colors to installations so so it was kind of a, a statement, right? It's a very powerful statement. And I, I wanted to ask you, the artist, how you felt being in this conversation, what you learned about each other. I understand that this is the first time that some of you learned about each other's work, which is kind of like incredible for me to think about that, right? That you're working in abstraction, but perhaps in a silo, that you hadn't had the ability to know, oh, wait, Edra, you know, and Victoria, uh, you're in Chicago, and, and, and yet, right, there's something about architecture, and you're in this conversation that puts you together in this way. Um, or Beverly and Evelise, right, um, and Cecilia. So I wanted, um, I, I, I know you have incredible chemistry between you, and I think that that's one of the great takeaways of this, of this exhibition, is the, the community that has been created. Um, so uh, on my end, I'm very excited about what I see and the potential collaborations that I see emerging. But I wanted to hear from you, right? Um, what it what is being what kind of you know what takeaways and what learn lessons you've learned from seeing your work next to these brava women like yourself. You're smiling, so Victoria, do you have anything to say? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm grateful that we were all brought together to have a show because I, you know, like I wasn't know Marisol's work or um, even Lisa's art. Um, I mean, through conversation, Arlene had brought even Lisa up, so. Um, but I had never seen the work in person, so that was great. And also oh, CJ, um, like, I just love her use of, of style um, and abstraction. So, um, you know, it, it was very educational to me. And, you know, I look forward to continuing this conversation with everyone in the group and then also ending the conversation um, outdoors with public works as well. Um, hopefully, you know, in New York, but also beyond um, Western perspective um, and in Latin America and elsewhere too, so. Um, Manda and I have been talking about this show for a couple of years. So for me, honestly, it's like a dream come true because it's been two years of conversation and, you know, timing. And for me, it's just been an amazing experience because it's all females and it's all these incredibly powerful intelligent women and we're all like working in the same kind of like expression but we're all doing different things and we're all complementing each other and we've all been so linked through this kind of like support system it's almost like you found your family or you found like a home that you know you have to ask Beverly, do you like that residency or like you know, Ivalice, how's Puerto Rico? Like what's going on with Edge? Like all these people, CJ, what's happening in Peru? Like you have these women that you know are supporting you in the same thing. They have your same struggles, the same questions, the same, you know, barri bar barriers. And to me, it's just like an amazing opportunity. I feel like, yeah, this was a very, very powerful statement for all of us to go into this very, very male dominated, you know, genre and just say, we're here whether you like it or not, it doesn't matter. And everybody, like we killed it together. Everybody complimented everybody. I'm just proud, I'm proud of the show and I'm honored. Okay, so there's two questions in the chat and I like, um, uh, uh, I believe Yvonne Acosta wants to know about 
how do you explain your practice or um, as opposed to the tendency to challenge, you know, the, the, the favor for realistic art, right? And um, you, you can read from the, everybody can read the, the question, but I think it's, it's one that, that has also to do with accessibility, right? How do you talk about your work and make your work known and uh, for people that may not understand necessarily what, you know, abstraction, you know, although abstraction can theoretically be more accessible insofar as, right, there's a freedom of, you know, interpretation. So that's one question um, in the table, if anybody would like to answer. Yeah, um, I'd like to answer. I mean, Yvonne is one of my students in Chicago, so I'm happy that, that she's present. But um, I guess sometimes it's it's a little, I feel like a lot of my work and part of the reason why it might be like um, in common with abstraction is because I always, I always felt that like growing up home, like at the dinner table, like I, even if I was a part of the family, like I really never really had a space at the table. Like my opinion really never mattered. I was always like, um arguing with that about like queerness or women's rights or um, color or um music so it was a constant argument and honestly i feel like when i make art it's more like it's my it's my space and i hold that space and i get to to create what i desire um so sometimes it's like um i'm creating my own space that at the dinner table <laughs> or like or, or my own version of what uh, like a a building or what a room a safe room or a bold room would look um so sometimes i don't show <laughs> my work um as soon as i create it with family members but i do with my friends and i think that's very important as well um people who form like my chosen family or people who are in the arts who support and, um, and, and appreciate what my mark making in general. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Beverly. No, Beverly, I was going to jump in because um, I feel like, you know, even just talking about art in itself with family, I think is actually quite hard. Like even, even if it were to be representational, I think um, at least that was my experience as someone interested in art from early on. Um, and so I, I, I remember feeling like, especially when I was a lot younger, like quite frustrated that it felt like there wasn't an understanding, even though I felt such a connection to abstraction as a language. So like my, as my sort of like what Victoria said, like it was like my space, like my language and I could like wield it and use it. And it had, and it had a real connection to like my experience. Right. It, it wasn't it wasn't actually about art for art's sake and it wasn't about the picture plane like as a flatness. It was actually about something uh, related to my lived experience. And I found that 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 it and I think over time what has shifted is my understanding of um, the fact that um, I just lost my train of thought. But what I was I was trying to link back to is that. Um, it's about a felt experience, perhaps, or it's about a different kind, something that maybe can't be translated so clearly into words, which is why it also exists in this other way. Um, and so that that element of that's what I was trying to say, like that translation, like what, like when something fails to translate, it's because there's something about its original form that's really important. And that's really hard to explain, right? Because I think things that aren't understandable or verbalizable, um, become opaque and then opaque sort of distances people from it but i guess i also wanted to share this that like for me abstraction actually began from observational drawing like i my understanding of what abstraction was began with concentrated observation of something to be able to represent it requires it to fall apart like your knowing of that thing has to kind of disappear um, you have to stop thinking about like the fact that you see the chair and the chair has four legs and you know they're the same length you have to kind of give in to the fact that they appear to be different sizes and they appear to be you know the perceptual experience is quite complex and so for me when i drew from life it was actually it, that is the site from which abs my understanding of abstraction came out of right like when when something disintegrates into something into it, it, you know it's no longer is what you understood it to be it, you understand it in a different way so I think also it relates to poetry, which is one thing that um, in that way, right, that like poetry takes language, which is something that's quite concrete, or we think of it as, you know, it can cup, 
right? And then, and then it's, it's, it's sort of used in this way to talk about something that's quite hard to explain or that isn't, that the words kind of fail to fully capture and only kind of like approximate, they create this kind of like, well, at least some of the poetry I love at least. And I think that that is something that I think abstraction, um, and, and, and then, so anyways, I guess I veer, veered off, but I do think there's this frustration with like explaining because of that, because, because you can't kind of, <laughs> um, um, and that's, I think, okay, maybe. <laughs> I well, I, I, I would like to add, um, talking about poetry, um, yes, I think that, that abstraction also links into poetry and poetry also into sensation, uh, into the less necessity of um, having to uh, say in a narrative way something. You know? um, it's a, I have to say, I actually, um, for me it's very important to talk with my family and people that are close to me that not necessarily are artists because i think that um yeah i think that they actually get the work and uh, and they relate to the materiality to the pulse to like um the sensations that they get through like a broken wall for example or like the necessity of like um thinking or rethinking what we are where we are you know is this public is this uh, private is this uh, an intense blue or this is a very quiet white or this is talking about our religion or this is talking about our senses so i have to say i i i think that people in general are really to abstraction in a very interesting way and and in it and, and very close. Uh, so I find that that uh, it, it could be more like a myth, thinking that people don't get abstraction. I think that people are very close to abstraction in general. And, um, and well, that's, uh, and, and we as an artist, we as artists uh, have a kind of privileged um, position because people tend to be, um, tend to give us, um, the possibility of being whatever we want to kind of be and so um so we have to be responsible uh, for that in a way that um uh, yeah I mean, uh if they are living giving us that freedom then um uh, yeah well i mean we we can mess it up but and we will mess it up but <laughs> uh um yeah we also um are kind of uh, uh, uh in, in the responsibility of uh of just keep keep working i guess i don't know i i yeah. right now i just got a little mess up myself <laughs> i i also think it's important to challenge you know this this strict opposition between abstraction and realism right because it's obvious that all of you work in across the spectrum right cecilia you're one right that you know you have these beautiful paintings you know that are very figurative and realistic and representational um, and i know that this is something that also comes up with beverly right in her own practice you know so so I, I think that where there's some, some, some of you are more committed to abstraction as a language, I, I think all of you are more complex than that, right? So it's important to know that that's, uh, that's another perhaps stereotype, right? The idea that, you know, you're abstract, you're always going to be an abstract artist. And it's, it's, it's a very, it's, 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 there's a fluidity. And I think that um, I, I blame the market sometimes and, you know, the ways in which people need to like be fixed and marketed or on very particular conventions, right? That reduce, right? The, the, the richness of what all of you do. Um, yes, Eve, you have your hand. No, I just wanted to say briefly that I think uh, uh, abstraction, the way we see abstraction traditionally, is as an essentialist language uh, that is that reduces uh, form. Uh, but abstraction in, in in a contemporary way, more than reduce, I think the the abstraction that we are, are all trying to do is one that instead of reducing. Is, uh, is opening up uh, meanings uh, and, and making them more complex. And, um, and so we are trying to, I think that it's very, it's, yeah, what, what, what the question is really very relevant because today we see so many images and so many things that it's very easy to, uh, 
to kind of dismiss them and, and how do you connect with 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 an image is very important i mean to to find uh you know if it's the title of the piece or if it's something that the piece is representing or pointing at so in that sense you find a, a, a you know a, a way to connect into what you're looking at and um and i think uh you know it, um in it's very important the way we speak about the work and it's very important, you know, um, because we are constructing an experience. Every one of us is constructing an experience uh, intentionally. Uh, so it's, it's a different way of dealing with abstraction as, as it was uh, dealt with in the past. Uh, so, um, and, and because like I said, we're dealing more with multiplicity. And um, so so I think that, uh, that I mean, you can approach at like like any other uh, thing in the world. You can look at it uh, from your individual perspective and and trying to just uh, approach the experience of what it brings. Um, for example, the colors, the form, and enjoy what it is. Or you can dig more into it and and try to investigate about what the artist is trying to do, what you know, what 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 the context of this piece is, where it was made, you know, where the the country of the artist is. All these things that bring meaning to the work, you know, and and will definitely will expand your idea of what the work is about. Fantastic. Um, I'm actually um, direct messaging with some people here about other things that they're like questions about what's Latinx art, but that's another conversation. So um, somebody wants to know, Edra, what's your wish list for an installation? And also, I think Ronnie Quevedo is so great to see so many artists in the chat and in the conversation. Um, I think we answer Ronnie's uh, question about your definitions of abstraction. Right and how you're articulating abstraction. I think all of you, you know, have have modalities. Um, we've talked about that, but um, I I wanted Edra to talk about your wish list for an, an architectural installation, and also uh, we have a young art, uh, another artist who wants to know about. Um, I think it's Ada del Pilar. Uh, which components do you see nurturing Latinx abstraction in the future or in your own practice? Um, I guess you know. Who are, who are, what are the major, um, yeah, I guess who's, yeah, where do you see, where do, where do you see, um, I guess Ada del Pilar is also an abstract artist and she wants to know um, where she can, um, um, yeah, where do, where do you see, where do you, where, what are the elements or spaces actually be, be besides uh, Latchkey Gallery that are not showing abstraction now? I think that in a way, I, I find that we're seeing a lot of interest with abstraction right now, but in your own perspectives, where do you see that interest coming from? I mean, there's always like Deja Clark. Um, I think she's an amazing artist who, um, I mean, I'm, I'm in a way inspired by her because of the, of the maquettes, like the architectural maquettes made out of metal um, that I've done more in person and then, um, from there, like jumping off to the like the larger scale pieces that are outside. Um, so I think that's I think for me that that's that will always be a reference. Um, in addition to the the I mean, in addition to what we're about here and something that relates to contemporary art or art history in general. Any other references or major influences or that you could point to in your work or just in abstraction generally? I mean, for me, I would say this is not an art history thing, but I actually think that diagrams are something I think about a lot in terms of abstraction, or like maps and, and what it means to try and like understand space, you know, to like to tran translate space three dim from three dimensions to two dimensions is a kind of pretty, like interesting place of i mean this kind of answers ronnie's question i guess in a way um that it feels like a diagram is actually sitting kind of between what i think we might call yeah. sometimes abstraction and representation right where you're taking something that actually is impossible to see fully like that it's actually invisible already to us in some way like the entire you know an entire the entire state of florida or the entire you know it's something that's like bigger than us or outer space right it's something that we have a lot of diagrams to explain or 
things that are super small, right? So sort of the limits of our ability to access, the things that are at the limits or outside of our ability to access them um, then get represented in certain ways so that we can understand them as a means of understanding. And I, and I think that that's the kind of, for me personally, I think that abstraction has always sit in that kind of space, like that it's, it's sort of is, and I guess in that way, it kind of becomes a little bit philosophical, right? That, that it's actually a way to talk about something that, I kind of said this before too, but that sits beyond other, the, the means of other forms of communication or other forms of, um, yeah, making meaning maybe or something, um, or not, or producing understanding. Which also leads me to think about like reimagining things and from like by then like, well, like, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm specifically t talking now about um, indigenous like gods and goddesses that once upon a time existed, but we don't really have access to the documents because they were destroyed. Um, but I, I, I do thought about Xochikatzal. She was a goddess in Aztec culture who believed in men, young mothers. She believed in education, weaving and embroidery. Um, and I feel like I connect to a lot of those different perspectives. And like, I, I often wonder her like what, um, and all the work that she might have created or, and what it looked like had, if there was documentation of that. Um, so I kind of like to, to honor her as I make. Um, and although like, she's not really brought up in art history, um, there, there's very limited resources if you dig really, if you research. Um, so that's another point that I kind of think about as I'm making work. I'm gonna jump in here and say that Carmen Herrera and Luchita Hurtado are big influences for me, more so about the art, of course, but the history and what they went through. And I use that as uh, inspiration and my thought process in the studio when I get exhausted, I'm like, no, there's a, there's a reason I'm doing this and there's a goal and there's a bigger thought process than just myself. It's more about representation. It's more about, can I push to help these women, myself, this community of abstraction, these women in abstraction, can we not be Carmen Herr a hundred having, you know, being represented the way that she has or having her first show at like 89, you know, are we going to be able to push past that and be what you consider, I guess, a norm in the, in, I don't want to use normal, but that's the word that's coming to my head right now is like that we're not just going to be like these floating artists that came through with no kind of like reference to art history one day, you know, I want us to be that now in this, this age frame, not later on down the line when we're all, you know, passed away and you know they're looking for the next cool thing to put up you know i'm hoping to break that barrier and to really just make us live a lot like right now right now to make history right now so with luchita and and carmen for me awesome um we could stay for like forever but we wanted to wrap it up but i i wanted um if we could just have maybe 30 seconds each some like parting thoughts from each of the artists um just because you have so much to share if you could just you know um one one single thing you'd like um viewers to take away from your work or take away from the conversation what would it be like right what, what would that what, what would that thought be and I like to start with, you know, just as we went through, you know, we started with Beverly and Cecilia. So let's just do that, you know, roll over again. And then we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to Amanda to write, wrap it up and say goodbye and, and everything else. So Beverly. Um, okay. So I guess one thing, it kind of came out, I guess, what I'm going to say from what has been said here tonight, actually, which is, um, I really liked what CJ was saying um, about, like, that we don't give enough credit in some ways, perhaps, to our audience. And I actually, I think maybe what I was saying earlier about my frustration, right, with family or, like, having to explain something that I was like, well, I, I mean, it's, I just understand it so innately, like, I don't know what, how to explain this, is that I think, I, I really do believe that it, it's actually about a slowness in a way that like, I think, I think abstraction asks, asks, and I think, you know, 
all of the work in this show, especially, but I think abstraction in general does ask you to, to be slower, to, to be okay with not maybe giving it a name to, or to understand. And I guess that's something that I feel like the market is, is it's a challenge for the market because they need to wrap it up and market Mark, the work has to be marketed to the market. So um, I, I find, I, you know, I've thought about that a lot. And yeah, so that there's, there is something felt, I think, there that, that you have to be open, like open to trust it, that your own intuition. Um, and I guess I'd hope that, that with the viewer of my work in general. So. That's beautiful. Thank you. Cecilia. Can I speak after? After Abs all of them? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Ivelisse. Thank you. So the question is about the meaning of abstraction? No, I just sorry, I got a little bit low. Um, you might practice in relationship. <laughs> <laughs> no, just 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 like some one takeaway that you would like to add since we're you know being oh, all right. okay. Um yeah, I think um I, I yeah, I, I really like what um what was said before about uh, the opening uh, of uh, an experience that is more uh, it has to, it takes you to to a place where you have to be slow slower and um, I think that I I really think that that abstraction is very relevant it's a very relevant um, image to study uh, uh, at this moment where where we are really being pushed to to ex to 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 experience uh, definitive uh, to have definitive experiences uh, in relationship to certain images uh, you know and uh, and to relate definitions to images in a very direct manner and uh, it's, that's very manipulative and um, so we are very manipulated through the image and so I think abstraction uh, brings you an image where that is that is actually making you aware of the experience of of looking, you know, of looking and of, of what, what, how that makes you think, you know. So so it's it's, it's actually very relevant. Yes. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, Marisol. Yeah, I mean, every, what everybody said, especially Beverly with the abstraction as for solace, I'm going to put that on a t-shirt because that is literally what I do in this time, so slow. But that to me is, you know, the beauty of what we do and abstraction is, you know, I, I just ask the audience to just to be, to be, to be open and to be patient and to engage in conversation with the artist and really understand before judging, you know, what it is that they're seeing in front of them and to actually uh, interlock with di and dialogue. And even if that's on Instagram and it's just, you know, I have people that are like, it's just shapes. But if you actually engage with me, you'll understand that it's more than just shapes and it's more than just color. And the color has something to do with, you know, emotions and meditations and the state that we're in. I use human skin tones to bring us together. So I just ask, you know, that the audience that's viewing the abstraction just engage a little bit more instead of, you know, just having a quick visual reaction. So that's mine. That's my two Thank cents. You. Thank you. Victoria. Um, well, I hope that um, I hope that the audience like had <laughs> looking at the work and also learned something and appreciated the color that we all um, did. Um, because I I just really appreciate that there's so much that I think that is kind of extracted from everyone's different um, cultural identities from from Latin America. So I I, I also hope that um, the audience kind of <clears throat> saw it as like a as a learning experience. So. Thank you, Edgar. Yeah, um, so uh, I think the, the experience of making art, uh, in, for me, it needs to be sustainable. It needs to be something that, uh, that 
that feels as honest as possible. So I, 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 I never consider configuring to a trend or to the latest thing. I think it's important to understand the contemporary art world and the environment and what is what are the conversations that are that are relevant and uh is in, and then uh you decide how you are going to engage with those uh, but um you know someone i think doesn't become an artist to configure to anything <laughs> so okay well, thank you. Um, I, I'm really at all of, all of you and um, just want to say that, um, yeah, you, you are brilliant. I'm, I'm a real fan and I want to thank Amanda for creating this space, really. Um, and I just really feel that there's a lot more to say and a lot more to learn from each of you. And I can't wait to see what's what's coming up. And that could have been the great last question. Where do we get to see more of your work? So I'm sure Amanda will let us know uh, because there will be information about the artists in the in the website, right? Um, I know um, Victoria has a, a show, right, coming up, a solo show coming up. You can see Eve Elise in the Museum of Art in Puerto Rico. I'm in Puerto Rico right now. Actually, I'm going to see the show very soon, next week uh, coming up. I know Cecilia has a solo show in Peru right now. Uh, Edra has shows in the Triennale in the Museo del Barrio and, uh, and also uh, in her gallery. Um, Beverly. Um, Mar Beverly, it's up. up. And Marisol just finished the, the first inaugural residency, right? at uh, Latchkey. So um, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. So I'm just going to unmute for one second. CJ, did you want to say something before we all, before we closed oh. out? <laughs> I, yes. My apologies. <laughs> <No. Cecilia. laughs> um, well, I, I just wanted to, to say uh, the the importance of um, silence too i think that is uh, in abstraction um, and um, and in the work in general and more coming out from this pandemic where like we have been with ourselves for long long periods of time you know and i think that we, we came to appreciate more like, silence for example and, and and um, even though I now my my kid is uh, laughing right now next to me, yeah, the silence is not around. But but yes, um, I wanted to talk that just uh, a little like um, your pause. I like I like what everybody say about the slowness, but also like um, the listening, you know, to listen um, and. Obviously, we want to say many things, but also maybe it's a good time to listen to. I think that was great. Thank you so much, CJ. Um, before we go, this is the last weekend to see XX. Um, tomorrow and Saturday will be open from 12 to 6 at 323 Canal Street. Natalie will be there both days, which we're really excited about. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to say, um, and Natalie, you can jump in at any time. The gallery has always focused on this idea of providing a space for people's work and ideas and thought process to be seen um, that would not normally um, have a space. So when Natalie and I, um, that was one of the main ideas of the gallery is to look at who, what, where, uh, is missing from the, from the conversation. And certainly in, in reflecting and, and being, you know, quiet and still this over this last year, we've learned that um, showing women was one of the things that we were lacking. And this is why in the last few shows, we've really been a focus on, on female um, artists or female identifying artists. Um, and so I just want to say that it's been a pleasure working with all of you. This was a huge show to do during a pandemic, um, coming from all over the country, um, flying, shipping, and um, thank you all for your patience. 
um, when we were putting the show together as well. One last thing, Victoria, I think the fact that your piece has that quote unquote misspelling or mis whatever is perfect because as a Latinx woman who messes up her Spanish all the time, I read, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you my story. And it wasn't until my mother who was born and raised in Peru came and she goes, oh, that's not what it says. So I think it speaks perfectly to who we are also as like Latinx people, right? We're going to mess that up sometimes because it's not our first language. So that's all I have to say. Thank you guys. Natalie, if you want to jump in, jump in. But thank you all. Arlene, always thank you for your support. And let's continue the conversation. Let's continue to support each other. And let's continue to offer a place at each of our tables that we bring out into the world. Let's make this sustainable for all of us. Good night, everyone. Thank Good you night, again. Everyone. Good Thank night. You. Bye.